Today, I have the privilege of hosting a trailblazing author and an advocate who is a prominent voice in the world of feminism and social justice. Her critically acclaimed book has sparked crucial conversations about intersectionality of feminism and the experiences of marginalized communities that have been historically overlooked by mainstream feminist movements. Her work has ignited change and challenged the status quo in profound ways. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming New York Times best-selling author of Hood Feminism, Mickey Kendall. Thank you so much. Mickey, first and foremost, thank you for being here. Your book, Hood Feminism, has a significant impact on the way we perceive feminism and its intersections with race, class, and social justice. Your book reminds me of Dick and other essays, a book covering race, gender, beauty, and education, challenging conventional wisdom and offers the critical perspective on social inequality, beauty, standards, higher education, and the intersections of race and gender. Have you encountered a book that has had a similar impact on challenging the status quo? This is going to sound like an odd answer, but uh, when I was a kid, I went to a book called Roll of Thunder for my class by Mildred Taylor. And it's a book that was the first book I ever read that was centered on Black people's experiences. It wasn't like the standard thing where it was like a book about white people and their Black friends. But instead, the whole book was from the perspective of a Black girl. It was about her family and their experiences in the Jim Crow South. And it upended my world in a way because I was so used to books where people like me weren't the focus. And it really, I think, is why I started to be more interested in writing and reading because then in trying to find more books like that, I was introduced to uh, Rosalind Brooks' work. I was introduced to Zora Neale Hurston and all of these other great black writers. But the gateway was what would now be called a, a young reader's book. That was the first book I had where a black girl was really the one speaking as the main character was the center of the story. And you tell us what inspired you to write Hood Feminism and what message you hope to convey through it? I wrote Hood Feminism because I got mad. Uh, one of the things that had happened in the, sort of the run-up to this was that a lot of conversations around feminism very much centered on white women's needs, white women's perspectives, but also on sort of catering to not being an aggressive woman or not being mean to men and all of these things, right? It was like lipsticks and last rooms, you know. He got to a place where I started to like, okay, what is the point of this movement if we're not talking about hunger or housing or poverty or any of these major issues? I could care less if you change your last name when you get married or not. I really care, though, that lots of women don't have a choice over getting married, or where they're going to live, or if they're going to be safe. And so I did not expect this book to become as big as it has. When I wrote it, I thought, I'm going to write this book, I'm going to say what I have to say, put it on the table, and kind of walk away from it. Obviously, lots of people share my feelings. Before we continue to talk, I'd like to explain what mainstream traditional feminism means. It's a movement that stands up for fairness between men and women and works to stop unfair treatment of women, it deals with lots of different things, like making sure women get paid the same as men, having control over their own bodies, stopping violence against women, and getting more women in important roles in our society. So in the book Hood Feminism, highlights that mainstream feminism is not doing enough to address the concerns and experiences of marginalized communities. In essence, the book challenges mainstream feminism to broaden its scope and become more responsive to diverse and intersectional needs of all women, particularly those who have been historically marginalized or overlooked by the movement. One of the central themes of hood feminism is the idea of intersectionality. Could you explain this concept and why it's crucial for understanding feminism today? Well, the concept of intersectionality is a term coined by Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, and it centers on the idea that race and gender dictate how black women are treated by the criminal justice system. It is since been extrapolated 
to cover the fact that race and gender are an aspect of everyday life. So they impact how you're treated in school, in medical care, in the workplace, wherever you are. And not just race and gender, but your physical abilities, your size, all of these different facets of life, your sexual orientation, your religion, they don't disappear when you walk into official spaces. They go into those spaces with you. And there in those spaces, other people's biases have an impact. And so one of the important things when we're talking about intersectionality is to realize that just because we say we want equal pay for the same wage isn't enough because if some people won't get hired for the job in the first place, they're still going to make less because we're not talking about race. Or if we say that, well, everyone's got access to public education, but your zip code dictates the quality of that education. And your zip, zip code dictates that because of segregation. There's this historical precedent of identity influencing every aspect of life in America and elsewhere in the world. And so we have to tackle as a global movement a global set of issues. Your book challenges mainstream or traditional feminist movements for often leaving out the experiences and concerns of marginalized communities. Can you share some examples of how mainstream feminism has failed to address these issues and the consequences of this neglect? So my big one is voting rights. In 2016, when everyone said vote for Hillary, a lot of black and brown women were saying, hey, we can't even get the panels to stay open so we can vote. Hey, our voting rights have been under attack for the last several years. And this was an ongoing concern back to 2008, 2000, you pick a year, this had been brought up again and again, right? The thing was, a lot of mainstream feminist outlets just ignored it. White women could vote, therefore everyone could vote. And then the election happens. And people said, well, why couldn't black voters save us? Why couldn't black women do this? And it had to be a conversation that basically boiled down to the problem doesn't start in the voting booth. The problem starts in who is allowed to get into that voting booth. And we see this over and over again where the crisis occurs and then, you know, you see those lovely taglines, vote by black women, listen to black women. It doesn't do you any good if you only do it one day every four years. You have to be thinking about these issues every day, every year, or you wake up with Roe v. Wade overturned and a uh, former president under indictment. In hood feminism, you highlight various areas where feminism should expand its focus, such as access to quality education, affordable health care, and safety in marginalized communities. What steps can individuals take to support these causes and help bridge the gaps you've identified? So my advice is for people who are in, let's say you are in a school district that has a very clear divide, right? This school is the good school and that school is the bad school. But they have school board meetings. Start asking questions. Start going to those meetings. You, your parents, even if you're in the good school, why is there such a thing as a bad school? We are all taxpayers, and we are all here for the education of children. Why are only some kids being given a quality education? You can follow me to people who are already campaigning around these issues because I promise you there's always a group that has been fighting the fight, and they could always use more support more access to resources, more voices to really influence the politics that impact education, housing, food, right? Whatever the issue is in your area that you see marginalized people facing, go and work with the groups who are already trying to change things. Write letters, call politicians. Remember that politicians are public servants. They work for you. You are not required to just let them do what they want to do. Feminism is often portrayed as a monolithic movement, but you argue that it should be diverse and inclusive. How can we ensure that feminism becomes more intersectional and responsive to the needs of all women? We have to give up the idea that there is a single version that will work for everyone. We have to think of this as a team effort and a an all number of sorts, right? And just because you like to stand on the left side of the umbrella um, and you like to be closer to the middle, it doesn't mean you don't 
that would deserve to be protected from the proverbial rain, right? So instead of thinking of it as that we're fighting over seats at one table, think of it as we need to build more tables so everyone has a seat. Wow, I love that analogy. Build more tables so everyone can have a seat. Your work has sparked important conversations about allyship. What advice do you have for individuals who want to be better allies to marginalized communities and support the feminist movement in a meaningful way? My first advice is get used to following and not necessarily leading. If you want to be supportive, that is great. It is wonderful. I encourage you to be supportive. But none of us knows everything. And just like I shouldn't walk into a meeting of, let's say, trans women who are working towards better job protections, better medical protections, and say, I know what you need to do, follow me. Instead, I should listen to what they need and then follow them. In the same way, if you want to call yourself an ally and I prefer Congress, you have to be ready to be told what to do and how to do it. Even if you think your way will work better, you're not an expert in someone else's experience or oppression. The title Hood Feminism challenges stereotypes and biases associated with certain neighborhoods and communities. Can you share some stories or anecdotes from your book that illustrate the strength and resilience of the women you've written about? So one of the things that I talk about a lot is that growing up, I was in a community where everyone was involved, right? It was a low income community, Chicago South Side. It has now been a kind of gentrified neighborhood. But when I was a kid, a lot of our neighbors were on food stamps. They were struggling financially in various ways. And so women like my grandmother would keep an eye out on the kids as they were going back and forth to school because so-and-so's mom had to work, but so-and-so still needed to go to school. Whether it was the postman or our teachers, any adult in our community really felt entitled to make sure we were good, we were going to school, our grades were good to ask us questions. And it was that kind of communal upbringing that meant when someone had a problem, they could go to a neighbor. They knew which neighbors to go to. And people tend to think of the hood as this scary, awful place where nothing good ever happens. But without that kind of support, a lot of us would have fallen through the cracks at a time when society frankly wrote all of us off. Your activism extends beyond writing, and you've been involved in various social justice initiatives. Can you tell us about some of the projects or causes that you are currently passionate about and how our viewers can get involved? Sure. One of the things that uh, I'm involved in every year is I put together sort of a coat drive for older kids. Another thing that I've been doing, um, there is a school in Jupiter, Florida, and a student reached out to me because my book has been banned there. So we are putting together a care package of books for her to be able to give those books out. Uh, one of the interesting things is that she already runs a nonprofit that I'm going to be highlighting that donates foundation garments, underwear, bras, that kind of thing to low income girls in her community, right? There is these basic need level things that I tend to like to focus on around food and clothes and warmth because people who have enough to eat and who are warm enough can think. People who have enough can then fight. You have to be able to survive in order to thrive. The world has changed significantly since the release of hood feminism. In what ways do you see progress being made in the feminist movement? And what challenges do you believe still need to be addressed? So the progress I've seen, and it's unfortunately called a cost, is when people realize that it's not enough to say, no, things are better. It's people realizing that things will not necessarily stay better, right? We thought Roe v. Wade was codified and the law could never be attacked. Here we are, but overturned. We are seeing calls in Nebraska to do away with things like no fault divorce, which sounds like not a big deal until you realize that if someone is in an abusive relationship, it may be impossible for them to leave safely. And so, one of the things I've seen is people recognize now wait a minute, just because this looks like it's not a big deal doesn't mean that it won't have other implications. I'm seeing people really engage with 
this affects me this way, how will it affect other people? How do we combat it? And I am so happy to see the conversation progressing because frankly, fascism is hungry. It never stops. And I know someone will say it's hyperbolic to describe these things as fascism, but when you start talking about taking away reproductive rights and rights to choose who we're in a relationship with and job protections and access to education, I don't have another word for what is happening. Thank you so much, Mickey, for joining us today on Unbanked Coolies. Your wisdom and perspective have been incredibly enlightening, and your work in hood feminism continues to inspire important conversations about the future of feminism. I'm truly grateful for your time and contribution. Before we go, is there any last message that you would like to share with our audience? Sure. A, thank you for having me on. This was great. B, don't be afraid to speak up. Don't be afraid to stand up to fight for your future because no one has a right to tell you that you don't get to decide the course of your life. I don't care how upsetting some people may find that to hear. The future is yours. Please feel free to latch onto it and fight for what you want it to look like. I'd like to express my heartfelt gratitude, Mickey, for your activism. It's truly inspiring, really. Thank you for your efforts in making our society a better place. Bye. You were great. You were too. Thank you.